version of the symphony, which is um, one, uh, it's interesting because if you know that the other versions, you will recognize lots of elements and thematic material, but then often arranged very, very differently. And uh, the third and fourth movements, for example, are completely different with the same motivic material often, but uh, yeah, so they're in, in fact completely different pieces. And of course, um, as, as we always do, we were using um, uh, instruments from the time, or at least the, the closest ones we could find so far. I understand that um, there are gaps of, of uh, information and data and just accessibility of, of some of these instruments that would be um, suitable for, for this repertoire. So uh, it's a work in progress. But uh, it's a, it's a, we say work, but it's actually fun. And uh, we're here also, of course, with the, the, the luxury of having the time to, to uh, take such a big piece and really work on details and um, really start from, from scratch in the best sense. But uh, Clive is here with us today um, to, uh, to help us along. I, um, uh, it'll be sort of an interactive uh, rehearsal situation, but also um, I thought, Clive, maybe you can... Uh, kick it off with um, a bit of information about Buchner and the conductors that that, work, that worked with him and uh, yeah hope you enjoy thank you okay good good can I share my screen so um, is that possible to do um, I need to get somebody to allow me to sh share my screen Okay. It should it ah. should be allowed. It should be allowed, <laughs> says Linda, but I guess it says host disabled participant screen sharing at the moment. <laughs> We're handling it. Is Luca the one? Okay. Yes, oh, Luca. Yeah. Okay. It should work now. Can you see it? Um No, not yet. Not yet? Okay. Um Okay, can, you see, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Um, so, what I thought I really should start with, I, I mean, I've looked into the question of conductors uh, quite a bit. Um, I think it's a subject we need somebody to do a PhD on at the moment, because um, the information that is now available has not really been connected for this, uh, has been not been collect collected for this. Um, we do know that there were two schools of conducting in the late 19th century. Um, there was the Wagnerian school, and I suppose that's the one to which Bruckner would have been closest in spirit. Um, the Wagnerian school involves a great deal of tempo flexibility that's not written down in the score. The stricter school to which we might say that composers like Brahms were closer, um, though of course Brahms also wanted flexibility, but not as much perhaps. Um, and we do know that some of the conductors associated with Bruckner were more likely to have used this kind of flexibility than others. Um, Hans Richter, surprisingly because of his connection with Brahms, was always noted for being rather strict and not making very much temporary flexibility. Um, on the other hand, uh, Hermann Levy, um, Hans von Bülow, other conductors of that time were also much much more. I think this is a, a, a really, really difficult issue. Um, my guess would be that Bruckner ought to have a really reasonable amount of tempo flexibility in the orchestral play, um, but we don't have very firm evidence for this. And one of the problems with Bruckner is there really was no performance history in his own lifetime. Um, he had very little of his music performed. He originally wrote the symphony too. Vienna Philharmonic soon after he completed the full score, and they said, well, maybe we could play the first move, the rest of it's complete rubbish. Um, and the, which is one reason, of course, why Bruckner um, made these changes. Whether he made them entirely from his own will, or whether he was talked into it by other people, um, remains a little, up, little uncertain. But it's, it's extremely interesting to try these early versions. Sometimes 
Um, a composer's first version can be considered to be better than the later revisions. We have this very much with Mendelssohn. His sister actually writes, Fanny Mendelssohn writes, that she could not understand her brother making so much fuss about the pieces he'd written, the Italian symphony, which he never performed in his lifetime. Um, he kept changing it, and she thought the first version was best and that all the changes he made just didn't really improve it at all. Um, and so maybe the case is, the same case is, it, it is true with Bruckner. In any case, we've, we've got this early version, and that's what, what you're doing now, and uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I thought I'd probably like to just begin this by recapitulating in a few of the issues we talked about last time in relation to more to French practice, but also obviously the contrast between French and German practice. And one of these contrasts is quite clearly the, the whole question of using vibrato in orchestral playing. All soloists by the second half of the 19th century were using vibrato in some form or other, or as I prefer to call it, trembling effects, because the techniques they were using to produce it were not the same that we use today. Um, the French seem to have been much more interested in it. On the other hand, evidence suggests that their ex more extensive use of vibrato, especially in the wind playing, was something that happens more in the early 20th century than in the late 19th. Um, in German practice, we had, I showed you this example from Hermann Hock, who was the concertmeister of the Frankfurt Museum's orchestra, um, in which he, he makes it perfectly clear that the vibrato was just coming in with the younger players in the 1890s. The sound is not going to be uh, characterized by very much vibrato. What we miss in even period performance of this music nowadays is the. We have to. We have to. Uh, we have to. Uh, yeah, we we uh, lost about uh, let's say forty seconds of your oh. of your talking because the, the your microphone. It, it or, was connection. It was connection. It was just a connection issue. Okay. Do you mind rewind, okay. rewinding about? 12 sentences. <laughs> you know, you okay. Um, uh, yeah. um, I, I don't remember whether, I don't know whether you heard what I was referring back to Hermann Hock's account of how yes. they started yes. to use vibrato in the Frankfurt Orchestra. Um, I used that, I showed that um, last time we, we, we talked. Um, um, so so we, we are aware that the younger players started to use some kind of trembling effects in the 1890s, not a fully developed modern vibrato, because Hopp later tells us that the, the vibrato of the 1940s was something much more um, extreme than what he was used to and didn't much like it. Um, so a certain amount of string vibrato was coming in in the 1890s, but that's much too late for this symphony. So probably by in the 70, 1870s when this was written, a very, very little vibrato at all was being used some of the players who had been trained in conservatoires might have been using it occasionally. And in the string playing, probably on accents. Um, in the wind playing, perhaps occasionally on very expressive notes, but early recordings suggest that German wind players were still really not using vibrato at all, um, even in the early 20th century. Portamento is the thing which I was just coming to when you when you came to tell me that we'd lost something. Um, Portamento is the thing we hardly hear in even modern period performance, but which would have really strongly characterized the playing of that time. And I, I've selected, I hope you can see my screen, because I've selected a few examples of places where I think that all the players would have been tempted, would have been from a natural instinct, using portamento. I'm here in the viola part. Can, can you see that all right? Yeah. Um, Shunska? Yeah, uh, it's a bit small, but Hello? We, can, we can see it. We can't yes. read the blue yeah. Hello, Shunska? Can't read oh, uh, ah, blue maybe you can't hear me still. Can somebody confirm whether I'm being heard? Yes, we can hear you. Hold on. We can hear Hold you. On. Um, yeah. Have we lost the sound again? No, we have not no, lost we can, the sound. We can hear you. I muted the room oh. for the stream because otherwise it would otherwise it would get feedback. Uh, but okay. I'm, uh, I'm 
starting to work on the other laptop and try to adjust the sizing and uh, the pixels of um, the screen that uh, the musicians are watching and uh, just uh, go ahead until I figured it out. Okay, C can you see the image on the screen? Yes. yes. It's, it's visible. But, oh, okay. Uh, it's a bit on the small um, can side. You see the but it's a bit on the small side, but we're figuring that out. I'll try to adjust oh, okay. it now. Um, okay, well, I've marked some, some fingerings into the viola part there in, in red. Um, and you can see this passage from the first movement, um, around bar 70. Um, careful, uh, so it's got to come out. Um, and I've suggested some fingerings that a, a viola player of that period might well have wanted to use to make that come out with a really distinct portamento between the A-flat and the F at the beginning. Um, so, the, so the finger on the A-flat sliding up relatively slowly as far as C before putting down the fourth finger for the F. We shouldn't hear the C, of course, but it's the place the finger stops. Um, and I suggested just with slanting lines in the cello part where the, the cellists would have probably been tempted to slide their fingers really audibly, I mean really audibly, not, not disguising the slides in any way. Um, and I think it's something you should really ex experiment with in, in, in the rehearsals. I, I've got another example a little further down the page there. Um, it's a bit difficult to manipulate this on here. Um, so here in the first violins, um, about around, around, well, let us see in my score, so it's a little bit um, <laughs> later in the score. Um, again, the sliding of the, of, with the first finger up by a third before playing the G sharp. And then in the second violins again, probably in that passage there, it's in, I think, bar 96, um, sliding the first finger and then stopping <coughs> the A with a fourth finger harmonic would be a, a, a very typical fingering practice of that time. Um, and when you stop a, a harmonic like that, you don't go cleanly into the harmonic, you come in a tiny little bit below the harmonic and slide into it. Schwartz tells us this in 1833, and it was normal practice all the way through the century. Um, the cellists, again, would almost certainly slide from the B natural to the E natural, um, and again, um, from the D sharp, uh, up there uh, to the A. Um, the first violins have certainly got to make a portamento when they come down from the G sharp in bar 99 to the E natural, stopping the G sharp on the A string, sliding the fourth finger all the way back to E before quickly putting down the first finger. Um, and when they slide back um, between the bow strokes, they would almost certainly also have made a portamento by sliding the first finger up to the G um, and connecting, um, making the bow change immediately after this slide. That again was a very normal thing. Um, in the following bar, in bar 100, the second finger would almost certainly slide down all the way to C before putting down the first finger on the D string. These, these are very typical ways of executing the portamenti. And again, I put a slanting line in the cellos from the E to the D. Um, um, in the last bar on that example. Um, and then if we go down a bit further, let me just um, bring you down the screen. We have this passage in the last movement where, where uh, Bruckner marks it to be on the G string, and that is a certain <coughs> indication that he wants a really pronounced portamento um, from the B flat down to the D flat. Um, really, really bringing that out. And the, so similarly, of course, in the cellos, when they have a similar figure, they play that certainly on the D string, um, uh, oh, sorry, on the G string, probably. Um, or they might use a kind of cheating portamento by starting on the D string, sliding the finger down, and then playing on the next string. Um, but all of these places would have been places where, especially when he says, Ausdrucksvoll, um, where the portamento was a really, really important gesture. It's inherent in the notation. Um, this is one of the things that there's a problem for modern players. We are so um, concerned to play the notes accurately as they there are on the page that we miss the messages that lie behind that notation, which were obvious to the players of that time. Um, 
And then there's the question of slurred figures. Um, Leopold Mozart tells us in the middle of the 18th century that when you have a pair of slurred notes, you make the first note longer and the second note shorter. In other words, you play them unequally. Now, one might think that that's simply an 18th century practice. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the evidence, for instance, of early recordings where we could still hear players do it, the Klingler Quartet recordings from 1910, for instance, are full of this kind of gesture, admittedly in Mozart, um, but there's the uh, Bohemian Quartet's recordings of Borjak, in which we hear them doing exactly the same thing, and they worked with the composer. So uh, it's pretty strong evidence, and Klingler himself tells us that everybody did it until 1900, and then it was gradually forgotten. Uh, he's writing in the middle of the century towards the end of his life. So when you have a passage like this um, in the, I think it's, it's that in the last movement of the Bruckner, um, you, you would certainly have played these slurred figures unequally. There's a passage further down the page here. Um, again, the same thing for the, for the lower strings. And also, um, let me just see my examples. Yeah, also the same things for wind instruments. So in this passage is, I'm just missing it out, wind, beg your pardon. In this passage is here, yeah, strings and wind, all of these figures would be inflected. The same thing is probably true of longer slurs, groups of three, four notes, um, but it's certainly very much true of the slurred pairs. We have to remember that Bruckner himself was a string player. He was obviously famous as an organist, but he had learned the violin to a high standard. And <laughs> what he had learned as a violinist would have been transferred to his thinking as a composer. Um, slurred figures are inflected in that way. Dotted figures, um, almost always dotted figures are slightly elongated from what the composer writes. So the little note is usually left late. Again, it's an instruction we find in 18th century um, treatises. Um, but it was still a practice which we can hear in all the early recordings of orchestral music. So the wind players would do it, um, also string instruments would do it. Um, I wanted to find some, I have some more things on this. Um, yeah, so here's another example of places where Bruckner has discriminated between double dotting and single dotting. And you might think that that's telling us something very precise, but he would almost still always have expected that the players would um, over dot and the double dots probably over double dotted and the single dots slightly over dotted and if you want some kind of more precise evidence for this we can only look at Wagner himself uh, do we have a passage yeah the, the Hello? dots are, the dots can be seen very very hard but I saw uh, on the bottom bottom right on your screen you can uh, adjust the size of your presentation if you uh, okay. click on the little plus Okay. Oh, ah, yeah. Oh, okay. Ah. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Yes, I think this works. This will work. Okay, good. So you've got single dots and double dots, and both of these will probably be over dotted. <laughs> um, and as I say, if we want, if we want a bit of a, um, historical evidence for the fact that this was still going on at this time, we can look at this passage from Wagner's Parsifal. Here you see the double dots, see the single dots here. Um, you'd think that Wagner was rather precise, but at the rehearsals of Parsifal, he stopped the orchestra at this point, according to somebody who was there and, and described the rehearsal, Heinrich Poikis, one of his assistants. And he says, Wagner says, says the orchestra, hold the eighth note with the dot longer, the sixteenth can then be somewhat shorter, more to be affected by inner strength. So he was specifically instructing his players to overdot. Um, as, I just, as I said before, you can hear it all the time on early recordings. So it was a very deeply ingrained instinct not to be precise about those things. Um, then finally, before you start to rehearse, I have to say a little thing about bowing too. We talked about this last time in relation to French practice. And the French were quite quick to start introducing um, conservatoire bowings 
things, more complicated versions, into orchestral playing. And I, I showed you this by showing you the two, two examples of um, Gebert's treatise, the first one from 1863 and the second one from 1885. Um, in the first one, these are the instructions he gives you. Simple, um, ah, sorry, difficult to control the screen. Um, simple uh, notes with separate bows but connected, so the string instruments. Obviously the wind instruments are going to use the same kinds of articulation. Um, then slightly separated notes on the string with a détaché, with you can, well, and he says you can use tout la longueur de lâché. Um, and then a détaché with um, dots and strokes, again played on the string. So there's no question that these are played on the string. In this case, probably in the middle of the bow or sometimes even in the upper half of the bow depending on the context. Then the portato, the slurred staccato, which is played on the string at the point of the bow, but he says you don't use it in orchestral playing. Um, and then simple slurred. So those are the bow strokes the French orchestral musicians were using in the 1860s when he wrote that treatise. Um, when he writes again 20 years later, 22 years later, uh, his uh, treatise is published, he gives you all of these conservatoire bowings springing off the string bow strokes. Um, we actually know specific, specifically from Hermann Hock's uh, account of discussions with Brahms when he was conducting the orchestra in Frankfurt that Brahms actually said to him, I don't like all these conservatoire bowings. Um, so by that time, perhaps some of the German orchestras were beginning to do it, but I doubt very much whether in 1874 any bowings other than the absolutely basic on-string bowings that Schwartz teaches in his uh, treatise of 1833 were being used by the orchestral players. They might have been using them in solo play, but they would not have been using them in orchestral play. Um, and we can see that maybe Bruckner's own experience as a violinist is apparent in some of his markings in the score here. Um, sorry, I just get the play thing in the right place. He's aware, perhaps, that in the 1870s, many players were beginning to use springing strokes for light, fast music. This is the scherzo, and he, he's very careful to write gestrichen an der Spitze, um, because that's the kind of passage that if you were to use French bow strokes, you would be um, using a sautier bow stroke in the middle of the bow. By the way, none of these bow strokes were being played in, in the lower half of the bow. The only thing that was ever played in the lower half of the bow at this period um, of short notes was the um, was this uh, matelé du talon, but it's not very often used and it's really probably only being used by French players. Um, Berriot says that this kind of stroke is normal in concertos. Um, then we have again Bruckner marking again with the same sort of passage in the last one, and the Spitzer gestrichen. So it's pretty clear that he's being uh, cautious to warn the players. And then here we have breit gestrichen. A lot of modern players might well play that uh, with a heavy bow stroke in the in the lower half of the bow. So it's probably with really broad bow strokes um, from the end of the first quarter of the bow towards the, the heel or the, the frog um, to the point. So uh, probably just not using that last quarter of the bow towards the frog very much in, at all. Um, so those are just a few thoughts that I have about um, the performing practices. And uh, Schonske, I guess that what you want to do now is to play and for me to observe and if I have some thoughts to um, Join in and talk to you. Yes. Um, can you hear me, Clive? Can you hear me, Clive? Yes. Yes. Um, actually, I thought, I mean, I have a few questions, actually, for you. Um, okay. But um, I also thought this could be a golden opportunity to, be, before we start rehearsing and making some hopefully pleasant noises, um, that we, uh, you know, if there are any specific uh, questions to, 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 to collect them now. I see already one from uh, uh, our food yes. Um Yeah, so is that, maybe maybe that's one way to proceed? We can 
Ja, ja absolutely. Ja. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question for the uh, um, overdotting. How big is the gap between the overdotted node and the short node? So normally we do a little gap down, da da, da da, something like this. And yesterday we, we discussed to play da da da, so very long first node. Yes, that's what I think. You would, I think that's what they would have done. They would have left the little note as late as they reasonably could. I, I think what you mean is uh, the length of the first note. So how, would they have? Uh, is there a small? Would, would, would there have been a gap between the dotted note and the and the the dotted note and the and the, uh, the short note? My guess is unlikely that that's the case. I think he would put a staccato mark on the first note if he wanted you to do that. It wouldn't be a normal thing to make the separation. Mm -hmm. I don't hear that in the early recordings yeah. either. It depends on how. Yeah. There's no relationship in... This is my question. Is there a re relationship between the long and the short note in the gap between the notes or not? Mm -hmm. so no, I don't think so. I think okay. you play ta ta da ta da in the in the long notes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really sustained. This is not what we usually do. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I mean, also that explains. Well, yeah, a lot of a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Um, yes. We had that discussion yesterday at the end of the second movement uh, that there was. Uh, in the in the orchestra uh, or in the winds there was da 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 means dotted and all the strings were playing thirds da 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 between it so we shouldn't adapt that to the thirds mm -hmm. to the to wow that that's a difficult question yeah. um because we have if 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 this had been written 20 or 30 years earlier, I would have said certainly you would adapt it to the thirds, yeah. to mm. the triplets. Um, it's more problematic at this stage. If Bruckner was very old-fashioned, which maybe he was, he might not have used modern triplet notation um, of, you know, a, a, a quarter note with a, 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 an eighth note and a, and a three over the top, because that's wasn't used at all in Beethoven's lifetime. Nobody used it. And it's only really beginning to come in around Schumann, that sort of period. Um, Brahms certainly does use that, and he uses a distinction between the two things. But whether Bruckner did, it's hard to say. Bruckner was older than Brahms. Um, he was brought up very much in conservative musical circles. So, I, I don't think I can give you a definite answer to that, but it's plausible that he meant them to be mixed with the triplets. It means the dotted, the dotted notes should, should be, a little, be a little sharper than the triplets. Or, or less, or, or with, with the triplets. Or with the triplets, yeah. Like, like I mean, <laughs> it's really, really hard to give you a, a, a definite answer to that. I mean, actually, if I were to study more of Bruckner's scores in detail, I might be able to say, well, it looks as if... I, I can't remember seeing the other kind of triplet notation, but perhaps it does exist. Yeah. We should try that later, yeah. this, this uh, yeah. bit here. It's also interesting... I, I, I will I tell you what I promise you, um, uh, Shudska. I will have a look at this afterwards, and I'll send a note if I can yeah, find some good answers. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, let's try that later. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering about the intensity and the speed of the portamenti. Um, yes. It, it, it makes a huge difference between a dia or is, if it's quick movement with a bit sound, uh, there's, a, there's a huge range of, of possibilities. And we, are, we have been discussing yesterday what is appropriate and what is out of taste. And this is, uh, from our point of view, hard to, hard to um, decide because. Okay. Yeah, you, in, in this passage here, you have been marking in the, in the score. Uh, this way, or is it too much, or is it, is it not enough, or is it too, too fast, too slow? What, <laughs> what, what is... Well, well where, where I tell you, I, it, it, would have, it probably, the whole range would have been used, but 
you would find that the players of that time were using a very slow portamento that you would find really rather shocking, I think. <laughs> Have you listened to the recordings of Grunfeld? Yeah, yeah. Cello yeah. recordings. I mean, you know, listen to his portamenti. They are, by modern standards, extremely slow. Yeah, but, but if I do it in my modern orchestra, I, I get thrown out. But also in this orchestra, if, if I do it so slowly, portamenti, everybody looks, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, it depends, it depends whether you really, really want to try and do what 19th century players were doing. They had a completely different aesthetic to us. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I'm worrying about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to try it. You have to yeah. try it and see whether you can make it work. Maybe as a modern player you don't want to do as much, but you can be pretty certain that they did do very slow portament. By, by the way, can you play us two, two examples? For we don't know the wind players. Can you play us two examples with the slow portamento? Yeah, the that's slow, good. Not so slow Something like that. Yeah. that, that, that was I can't. I actually can't hear. I can't hear that. Hold on. I can't hear that at all. Uh, Here's also the thing, I think we think that we need to consider is that as, when, it, when it's done as a collective, yeah. it, um, and just like anything, it, 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 um, it, uh, what do you, what do you um, it uh, acquires a new dynamic, right? I mean, per person it might be a lot, but as a group it might be just right. You see what I mean? Like it's a little bit like inquire. You overpronounce, right? Mm -hmm. Like on the individual ne level, you yeah, really need to overpronounce. But then, as a collective, it sounds just right. So you know, I think that's also something we need to. Yeah, but it's nice to have some uh, rule if it's quick. Well, so of course, rules, of course. Oh, yeah, but when you go up, you do it differently when you yes. pronounce. Yes, no, I agree. So I think it's and what we need to do is to do it in as a group. You see what I mean? Because that yeah. that no, that no, will no, sound no. different yeah. than, yeah. See, than you were doing it just on your own. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would uh, Schultzke cut two things. One is that I can't hear any of the music. It doesn't no, come across at all. Now. I don't know whether we it's try the... again. We could try again. Um, uh, there's a okay. different. Uh, uh, there's a different um, microphone. Uh, uh, no, it's a different setup on Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just do your portamenti again. No, I still can't hear them. I can't hear anything. Give me a second. I, I'll try adjusting some more. Yeah. Um, anyway, when we can sort that out. Yeah. The other point to make, though, the other point that's really important to make is that they almost certainly did not plan this. They did not do it as a whole section necessarily. Individual players would have done it where they felt it was right. Um, you can hear that on the early recordings quite clearly. Um, it's. It's just something about when you shift on a string instrument, you shift by using portamento. That's this is how it was. They were trained. Can you try again now? Ah, now yeah. I hear a different sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Yeah. yeah so, so I would move, I would move my hand even more slowly. I would move my my hand higher. Yeah. Try it even slow. Yeah, that's beginning to sound more like Grunfeld. <laughs> <laughs> and Grun no, I mean, people love to the way Grunfeld played. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think you should be frightened of trying to do this. It's a new way of being expressive. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's something we'll definitely let's try that bit yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But is, yeah. uh, is there a difference in the use of portamenti for solo and orchestral play? Because Grunfeld was a solo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Grunfeld was a soloist, but you hear it in the recordings that, that they are doing it in the orchestra too. But it's maybe not quite so pronounced, but it's still there, very, very, very most. And maybe um, um, as a as an add-on to that, um, somebody 
asked the question yesterday. What about, you know, for, me for melodic material, it's quite obvious, you know, that one needs to um, approach it with, with, with legato and portamento. What would you say about accompanimental figures? You know, we have quite a lot of very, um, yeah, snaky, let's say, um, rows of eighth notes, you know, which could lend itself to portamento just staying on, staying on the string, uh, on, on one string. Um, how, how do you see the difference between, uh, yeah, the use of portamento between different type, uh, roles of music? Yeah, yeah. If, if it's purely technical, in, in other words, it's an, uh, an aspect of shifting the hand, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to shift the hand, mm -hmm. then it probably was done uh, fairly fast if they weren't trying to be expressive. Mm -hmm. They would do it more slowly if they were right, uh, playing an expressive mm -hmm. phrase. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, Carl Flesch at the time when people were beginning to get a little bit um, against portamento, he talks about something which he calls a bus portamento which is the, the most convenient way to get from one place to another quickly, <laughs> which is sliding the hand fast between the notes. Um, he's not very keen on it, because he doesn't think that it's there for a good uh, expressive purpose, but that's how people were shifting. Yeah. Um, but they were shifting more slowly when they wanted to be expressive. but they sound very different. And in some passages, I have to combine those fingerings, but I don't know if I should try to make some everything even, or if it was wanted that it sounds one note a bit like this and the other a bit more like this. Yeah, I think the main thing about the oboe play was that they, were very, they could produce wonderful legato, um, and they would be aiming to do that as, as an aspect of um, style, because the string players were producing this wonderful legato, which involves portamento. Now, the oboe can't so easily do portamento, and they, there's not a lot of evidence that they were doing it, except very rarely as an expressive thing. Um, so you would be aiming to find the most smooth and um, legato way of playing slurred phrases, um, what we do know about the German oboes is that the, the tone was very strong and quite harsh. Very different from what we think is beautiful oboe tone nowadays. So I don't know whether you want to play with that kind of almost trumpet-like sound. So this, this would mean that I should use more like the new fingering with the keys, which sound more loud and... Yeah, probably. For us now a bit more ugly. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. for me, as a reflect, I try to use always the long fingerings, which sound more smooth and more soft, because I find the short fingerings a bit ugly. <laughs> but yeah, probably <laughs> they, they liked it or yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, the, the, yeah, it was one of the big differences between German and French practice that the French oboists were producing, and because of using different reeds, they were producing a different sound. The German oboists were really definitely quite a powerful and astringent sound. Uh, I didn't mention it about the horns, by the way, but, but, but um, they were still using a lot of hand stopping in the horn playing. Um, even even in the French practice, you look at Gewert's treatise, and it's full of stuff about hand stopping. And I, I think this opening horn solo in the in the first movement was probably expected to have a hand stop on the second um, entry of the horn. There, I think it's G flat, isn't it? Um, for that note, so you wouldn't play with a smooth modern sound there. Um, Actually, uh, right uh, to, to to stay with the horn or, or just brass instruments, uh, um, uh, maybe in general. Uh, how was? I mean, maybe portamento is maybe too too much of a word, but how how would the attitude have been? Because I, I specifically asked that question because um, uh, there's a there's a beautiful record the the fourth uh, the fourth thing the recording of of this of this one. 
in the opening, uh, in the horn opening, there's you, you, you hear that the horn is, goes through the, um, the in-betweens, or between, yes. the, uh, between the fifth, you know, he doesn't go <coughs> cleanly, as it were, from yeah. da, 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 there's a slight yeah. blur yeah. in between. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, they would definitely have been doing that. Uh, you know the, you know the, the um, pre preface to Wagner's uh, Tristan, where he talks about the horns, and he says the one thing that he thinks that the valve horns tend to lose is this ability to connect the notes. So he, he's definitely thinking about that kind of uh, connection, point to make. There's a connection in, in, in horn playing. Um, yeah. And, and, and you remember the, 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 there's a treatise by Froelich in 1811, at the time when Portimento is becoming a really big thing and very fashionable. And he says that if you want to be up to date artists, you um, horn players, you um, oboists, you flautists, clarinetists, trombonists, you all have to learn how to do Portimento if you want to be up to date artists. That's 1811. So it was definitely the generation born around the 1810s, 20s, 30s, were going to be um, experimenting with that as far as the instruments allow. Mm -hmm. cool. um, there was actually one other thing, Shonska, yes. just before you go on, mm -hmm. because I never talked about this, but the tempo issue mm -hmm. of, of this. I, I mean, I've listened to all the, early, all the modern recordings of this piece I could find easily, and it's incredibly slow, the first movement. Yes. Incredibly slow. We the agree. thing has a line through the sea and it's allegro. Yes. We agree. I would think it gets something almost like double the speed most people play. Yeah. We, we nearly got there, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. There were yeah. two, two hands I saw. But, yeah. Um, Hannah. Um, I'm still thinking about what you told us about the bowings the other day, which I found really interesting, yes. and how we can really make use of it in the in the Bochna. And for example, now you told us, I think it was, I couldn't see clearly, but I think it was in the fourth movement, uh, around bar 70, when the violins go, ja, da, 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 and you said, it says, um, it's an der, an der Spitze gestrichen. Yeah, yeah. But, so yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about how much we adapt to the violin in the cellos, because with us it only says, Markiert gestrichen. And then I'm wondering, in that time, did they actually then use also an der Spitze in the celli, or is it another instrument, another bow? Do we take, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yes, I think they would have used the point in the bow, uh, not quite as much to the point as the, stri as the upper strings, but if you remember when I showed you the, the ones from Vassin, um on uh, whenever, last time we, we, we talked, um, Vassin, um uses all the time the middle and the upper half of the bow. Um, uh, and when, when it says, um, mark, mark, what, what exactly was the marking again? Um, yeah. When it says that, he's, pro he's not meant it, meaning you to play right at the point in the cellos, he's meaning you to use more bow, but from the middle to at least close to the point, okay. with fast, heavy bows. This would be also I my question. Uh, the 83, bar 83 in the first movement, uh, on which uh, the position of the bow... Uh, I, think um, I have to find my score, oh. just a moment. Uh, um, 83 in the first movement. Yes. So um, just a minute. Ah, so, okay, that, that passage... Yeah. Um, bar 83, sorry. Uh, so bar 83. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 that's okay. Um, yes. Well, I suppose you're playing up, down, up. Uh, sorry, up, down, up. And I would play starting pretty close to the point, go to the the middle of the bow, and then come back to the point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. 
And actually, um, sticking with the, with the violas, yesterday there was a question, I remember, uh, wrong book, um, in the fourth movement. Um, um, uh, So we're, we're in the last movement, letter B, uh, by 73 in the viola part, Some, something like this, you know, where um, there's a, there are, uh, it's a jump, uh, jumps of fifths, yeah. pianissimo with dots. What, what would you suggest there? Um, I'm just looking for 73, 71, 72, 73. Um, in the last movement. Yeah. Uh, I can't find this passage. It's not in the my score. It isn't at 73. Wait a minute. Oh. Um, oh, do you have the... Uh... I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't... I, haven't, I only just got the, the, um, right. the, the other so... score you're using. And I can't, haven't found my way around it yet. Okay, one, two. Um, Actually, also in the, uh, in the version that I... The, in the wrong version that I sent to you, it should be by 73 as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe I could, just a while to find this 73. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Where is the camera? Uh, maybe. Yeah, it's not the last moment. I'm just trying to find 73 now. Yeah. I've got 73, yes. Are we talking about what, the cellos? Did no, you say? no, in the violas. Oh, by the violas, okay, yeah. Um, okay. I would say that that passage is going to be played well, around three quarters of the way towards the point of the bow, or even even much more at the bow, at the point, because the, the upper strings have just started playing an der Spitze. When it's pianissimo like that, I would think it's played very close to the point. Mm -hmm. So kind of a... Uh, but because of the dots, it would be a little bit more separated. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that, yeah. that, that leads me then to the next... Uh, well, one of a few questions that I have. Um, and what's, what's actually, I tell you what, sorry, um, Chunska, mm -hmm. I don't think the dots are telling you to play it differently from the upper strings. Mm -hmm. I think the dots are there because the upper strings have started slurring at that point. Oh. In, 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 and he's, he's putting that to, to ensure that the cellos <coughs> don't slur. Uh -huh. Right. So I think they continue doing the same articulation as the, as the upper strings were doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, actually, um, yeah, but it's going to the vibration and the vibration. Yeah, we're going to the vibration. Clive, um, I have a question about the word, two, two words actually. Um, we often have the, uh, the, the indication gestrichen, so so yeah. not slurred. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not slurred. Right. Um, and I think just uh, uh, we've noticed that from our feeling, uh, just kind of instinctively when we see that, we also tend to disconnect, if you see what I mean. Uh, we, yeah. we, we do the down and up and we don't do a legato, I mean, uh, a legato uh, bowing. Yeah. How do yeah. you see that? I mean, is it, is it just... I, I you should play that with a connected um, yeah. separate bow. Right. Because he does staccato marks in other places. And I think what he's doing is saying gestrichen, not slurred. Yeah, yeah. Separate bows, not slurred. Yes. 
That, that, that's, that's clear. And then also the indication of barcato. Now this happens quite often in all sorts of contexts. It happens in fortissimo, it happens in pianissimo. And again, our, let's say, instinct when you see marcato is again to hammer it and to, and to kind of disconnect the notes. Um, and we were experimenting yesterday where we play it in a, let's say, prominent way so that it's noticeable, but still with legato as, like, uh, uh, um, for example, uh, if, if you look at the uh, first movement, um, uh, it happens already um, in bar forty-three. Yeah. Um, in the in the string mm -hmm. tremolo, and then but then very prominently, of course, in in letter A. Bar fifty-one, when the when the theme starts. And I think, in, basically, in all recordings that you find, these this this theme is very detached. Yum bum 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 bum. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, my idea was that, you know, he does give this same thematic material in other places, but then with accents on top or some sort of sign on each one of these notes. And then we can maybe detach a little bit. But if you don't have any markings, such as in bar 51, letter A, then you would play it in a, in a way that it would stand out, but it wouldn't be... Uh, uh, staccato. Um. Absolutely. I mean, in fact, if you look a little bit earlier where the upper strings are playing, well, everybody's playing with uh, a tremolo mm -hmm. effects. Yeah. You also have the marcata marking. Yeah. And there you certainly can have any separation. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, you're right uh, uh, that you play it marked but with a real legato bow stroke. Yeah. Okay. So in ma ma marked on the uh, thematic level and not on the notes level. Is that, yeah. uh, is that a, is that a yeah. fair? Yes, assessment? bring the figure out. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. That, that's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, and maybe the other thing I, I had was, if you can clarify, I mean, of course, signs can mean many, many things um, and may, mean uh, even within the oeuvre of one composer, it can mean different things. But can you give us a, Give us a sketch of what an, an accent, so a, a small hairpin uh, on, on one note could mean. Uh, and also the little, the little hat, the little, uh, yes. the, the little V sign uh, that happens. Um, what distinction there might be between, between those. The correct answer, I can't be sure. Um, the simple answer is that when you have the one that goes... Um, yeah. yeah when it's like a small sign it actually means that that you act at the beginning of the note and you, you let the sound come away mm -hmm. with the other hat, hat things the sound does not come away it's a strong attack on the note but mm -hmm. but the little hat unfortunately had many meanings in the 19th century for some composers it was a light accent for others it was a very heavy accent so you know it's I think with Bruckner it was a very heavy accent because there's one example, in, I think it's in the seventh symphony, where he writes them and then he changes his mind in the string parts and changes them to a succession of down parts. Ah. Mm -hmm. also, it's separation. We have that actually in the, in the last one, don't we? Yeah. With, with, with uh, hats. It's, it's anybody's guess what was in his mind, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But in, uh, in the last movement, he writes the luto also, so it really means like you have to yeah. the whole of the very yeah, 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 exactly. Tenuto actually has the meaning of an accent as well for, for early 19th century composers and 18th century composers. So I suspect that tenuto didn't just mean uh, hold the note, it meant accent the note as well. Mm -hmm. It's really important line that people use, mm. which, which has a element in it. Mm. Great. There's, oops, there's one question. Yeah, this can come just with some, with some facts that come back to the, the winds and portamenti. In trombone playing, if you play a slide trombone, if you um, 
some of the slurs you do would result in a kind of glissando, means portamento. And yeah. uh, the, the treaties from the 18th century and all the modern treaties, they say you have to avoid it, this by any cost. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, but I know, as I had uh, when I was young, I had lessons with very old teachers, and they told they told they told uh, uh, that we have a special technique which is not in use today anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that is in German, it's called Stimmritzen uh, Legato. That means yeah. you play, especially very close intervals. If you play, play them slurred, you play them without any articulation. You just have yeah. to move your slide very fast. And that's, this results in, in a bit more uh, hmm. uh, portamento style than you hear today. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I, I'm absolutely sure that that's what they would be doing. Because the, the model for all of them at that time, all instruments, was singing, even pianists. You know, Talbert writes a, a treatise called La du Chant Appliqué au Piano. And, uh, and so that's, they, they really aimed to connect with, with singing, and therefore you want this really beautiful legato which you hear in the early singers. Nice. Let's try, let's try that. Uh, in, in another place uh, where we can do that. Very hard to yeah. do, but uh, I, I will try. Yeah. Well, let's find places. I mean, I think for, for some of the. Uh, are there, are there further questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of related to the lower octave of the bass. And we've been struggling with this question all week, but basically. So I'm looking at letter 51, for example. Or, uh, sorry, number 51, letter A. 31, I can't read. 31. Um, he doesn't actually continue down the octave because the basses in and around Austria at this point in time didn't have the fifth string. But by the time this was actually premiered in the 1880s, they very likely did have the fifth string. And so we've been wondering what the most appropriate way to sort of play this line would be. There are two five strings in the section right now. The method books at the time don't talk about the fifth string because it wasn't really known. What do you think? Uh, where are we talking about? Which was the thing? 31 in the first movement. Oh, 51, sorry, 51. 51, 51 in the first sorry. movement. Um, let me see if I can find that. Basically, any time there's a line that goes down that exceeds the compass of the instrument, we'll already back up. And now that we do have a five string, and by the time the symphony was premiered in 81, they did probably have five strings. The question is, Okay. Well, I'm, I don't think there's a very good answer to this one because I think that um, they would have done whatever felt they felt they wanted to do because yeah. bass players were notorious in the, in the 19th century for adapting their part parts. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> difficult in general, but um, but simply you know they they, they improvise. Yeah. Therefore, I. Do whatever feels right. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in that particular case, in 52, yeah, yeah, ba 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 ba, probably you can go to the low E flat, but then da um, ba, because that's what the cellos sure. do. Sure, that, that's you know, that, 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 that would make sense, you know. Yeah. 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 And Wagner, when he, when the when the Wagner does the Mont Blatt, yeah. he, he said the, the, the one bass go. You mean at the beginning of the Rheingold? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that means if it's later, um, or maybe they have different uh, tuning. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. So. There's a whole tradition of scored tour for the low string in the 19th century. So, I mean, but since there's nothing written, mm. that's sort of their question. But yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very it's a very modern attitude to think that you should do exactly what's in the score. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was more about the question of limitations of the instrument and how, how do we approach it. If we're thinking traditionally of, oh, this is actually the instrument that I have, a four string. Do we then, now that we have five strings as historical players, how do we handle that? 
Also, there were five strings in Vienna floating around in the Wiener Stimmung era. This is more of a Sure. Sure. So, so my answer would be do whatever you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably there would have been. It would be fair fair to assume that in 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 a given ensemble there would be also different kinds of bases like coexisting, right? I mean, four and five, and maybe even three in some situations. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, no. yeah. Do you know when they invented those machines? Where it's in the early 1880s. In the 80s. Yeah. And Leipzig. Yeah. yeah. So the noise. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there aren't any further questions, I thought we could try out uh, a lot of these things. Um, should we? Yeah. Let me. Should we do a tune. I mean, I'll, I'll have a look at which which one we can start with in the meantime.
Yum, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Should we start with that actually? Um, let's start with the Envar 51 Bushtaba. Um, I think that would just lend a whole, whole different character to the whole. Can we try um, uh, cellos, cellos, basses, and uh, and uh, trombones, posaunen besser? Ja, und schau mal, ob wie, wie weit für diese, vor allem diese Triolen, ne? ja, ja, da, 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 wirklich so, so legato möglich in die, in die nächste Eins hinein. Sollen wir das einmal probieren? Besser und, äh, besser und posaunen. Ja. Ich finde das legato, uh, the, that legato, we should not equate that with heaviness. No? Maybe even less, weniger Widerstand sogar. In, in Natürlich mit, mit Qualität, aber dann nicht ähm, schwer. Wow. Maybe even in this case, especially for the um, for the for the string, for the string, but we should use the triplets as momentum, schwung, in um diesen großen Sprung uh, zu machen. Yeah, so that's my, uh, should we try that once? 55, get into it, 55. 55, what do? <laughs> Shall we shape the eighth, uh, the, sorry, the quarter notes a little bit more? Jump and jump, ba ba, jump and jump, ba. It doesn't jump, ra 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 ra, jump and jump, ra ra ra, jump. It's going to be for all over the trio, a little, yeah, bis jetzt um, zu zu getrennt war. Yeah, fünf und fünfzig. What two? <laughs> And actually there we have the accents, no? Um, should we try that? Also nicht entspannen, aber zurückkommen. Ja? Äh, Nochmal dasselbe mit ein bisschen mehr Aufmerksamkeit auf den Akzenten. Gleiche Stelle. One, two. Tempo to you, Clive. How's it sounding? That's the tempo's great. I'm, I, I, I think, I think I would connect those notes much more. Pa, pa, e, oh. pa. I wouldn't make a break between them at all. Mm -hmm. Despite the accents. Yeah, I mean the the accents are the slow, you know, the, the diminuendo accents, but they don't really mean separation. Right, right, right. That's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Should we try that? Um, so we we keep it under a legato. So we shape within, but we don't separate, if you see what I mean. Or try not to separate. 
you try that one? Just the string basses. Uh, from uh, 58. 58. Ready? One. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Should we try the upper, the upper wings yes. as well? Von, uh, von Buchstabe A, äh, Trompete, Hörner und ja, alle Holz, also außer, außer Verlust. Um, would it be possible to do less articulation in between the in between the notes on the triplets. A bit of more, bit more of a softer. Uh, and then on the other hand, maybe the, cor the, the what do you call them in English? Quarter notes. So lots of line and direction on the triplets. We try that? Ich finde das immer noch bisschen bisschen klebrig bei 58 und 60. Ja, dann ja, ba, ba, ba. Fast, fast einen, fast einen. Können wir das machen? Ähm, dort. 58. 58. One, two. Ja. Hat du Von einem Ja. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I have to say that when I was listening to that pum pum pa 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 pum, um, it struck struck me that there shouldn't be actually any separation because he does put staccato dots when he wants them. Yeah. And yeah. what I was hearing was pum pum pa 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 pum pa ba 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 la di, which is as I would, would have yeah. expected yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, in essentially a, a yeah. legato. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try it like this. Yeah. yeah. Ah ja, super. Äh, Buchstabe A. Ja, well, actually all of us. All of us now. Ja, yeah, all of us legato. Ja, 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 ja. Ja. And of course, because, because, the, because the, upper, the upper strings are doing tremolo, I mean, you, you don't get any separation at all there. No, no. Du singst jetzt immer, wenn du singst, legato, doch mit über die Zunge. Ja. Können Sie einmal probieren? So? Ohne. Einfach die. Moment, die kommen besser. Ja, das ist das whole point, actually. You know, that it's, it's marcato in the themat on the thematic level. Ja, it's not on the note level, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so it, we're marking the theme and not per notes. Because I think then for that he would have had other signs okay, sure. to tell us, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to rethink. Yeah. Genau, ja. Ja, let's try it. Also, zusammen, Buchstabe A, oder vielleicht doch ohne, ohne, ja, zweite Umbreitung. Bisschen, bisschen Kraft sparen. Ja. Okay. Ja. 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 Ja.
Okay, book shot. Ah, uh, here we go. One, two. <laughs> schon wesentlich anders als man das ja. ja mir gefällt das eigentlich sehr es ist so es ist es kommt diese lange Linie viel mehr von selber ja what do you think of that ja yeah, ja yeah. it should be a real wash of sound I yeah. think that's great <laughs> a wash of sound ja 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 a beautiful one too good should we then go back to the beginning once and try Try these rhythms and see what you can do with the fundamental and maybe the, the soft note on the on the G on the on the, yeah, the G flat. Yeah. And I noticed that David contrabass now, so you are playing the gun, 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 gun. So do you want to follow that? Uh, that is the point. Yeah. We, we, we don't have to. Yeah. yeah, I think you do you do what you need to in order to get the same, get that effect. But I think, I think a little bit different. You know, different. Like you don't yeah. stop yeah. Yeah. the I mean yeah, we shouldn't stop. Yeah, it should it should go on. <coughs> yeah. Actually I uh Junske, yes. um I had I had the feeling that when the phrase da 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 is being played, yeah. that the the first and the second notes are getting the same amount of accent. Uh -huh. Whereas from a metrical point of view, it should surely be ta da dee da da, rather than ta da dee da da. Yeah, ta da 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 da. It should go more. Ta da dee da da. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. I think we often forget that in yeah. metrical accents. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Let's try. Noch mal, noch mal Buchstabe A. Ein bisschen noch mehr. Ja. Legato sowieso. Aber dann. Vor allem nicht gleich das gleiche Gewicht bei Jampa. Jampa, ba, 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 ba. Ja, ja, ra, 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 ra. I'm noticing, I'm noticing. Okay. Buchstabe A. One, two. And for all these steps, yeah, bam, bam, they are two times on the six, yeah, bam, da, 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 and then freedom, yeah, bam, 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 yeah, bam, bam, bam. Can we try that once? The quad six, takte, five and seventy. No, that's not right. Yeah, five and seventy. Excuse me. Yeah, no more to the front with the yeah, bam, ja, bam, bam, ja, bam, 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 bam. Yeah, fifty-six. No, sixty-five. Sixty-five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sixty-five. Uh, one, two. Uh... Yeah. Good now. Let's have a bit more zoom. Yeah. Are we doing better? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good. Then let's go to the beginning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a close note. It's the opposite. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that means uh, there are. Uh, there are. I can change the form because it's in F. Maybe if I play in another tonality, I could close it. So it's a bit too. Uh, sorry. Uh, just to be sure, you're talking about the note in bar seven, the G flat. Right. Yeah, that would be an open note. Then. And are there then soft notes at all in your, in your. In this passage? It depends if I change the... Ah, okay. Because, but that should be a bit artificial, right? Because yeah, because you would change... Yeah, you want to stay on the one stop, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can you try just on the one stop and see what... See what appears? Okay. Let's try the beginning.
this connection that's starting to, to happen now between the between the intervals. Uh, does it does it feel right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's more natural. Yeah. It, I mean, li literally more natural. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. So I want to also add to this this feeling of bringing the the, the last note uh, in all parts as late as we can. Yeah. Let's add that as well. And. Um, do you mind doing a, uh, um, a bit of slowing down in the strings, uh, or at least kind of being being a, being a bit uh, aware of okay. in around 15, 16, 17 with this pin, uh, with, with this um, triple piano um, that we go down in dynamic and in tempo at that moment. Good. What's my beginning? So you feel you it's too late. It's also to um, in uh, 45, you know, when you have the other, in, um, two, three, four, in 44, when you have the mezzo forte marcato, can you get that also more legato as well? Is that possible? And since uh, we have such an appreciating audience member of, uh, of, uh, of uh, tempo flexibility, let's try, um, especially after, I, I think this, this, this gradual push, we're, we're getting really good at. It's really, 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 very beautiful. Very thrilling to listen to. Um, and then, you know, this uh, C flat chord um, in 46. Could we try that? And then linger, linger around there um, and, and see what we can get. Should we try this uh, from... Oh, let's do this, this bit here. Uh, 35, 35, 35, one, two. must agree at Buchstabe A alle nach vorne vor, voranzugehen. Ja, das können wir es äh, machen äh, von 43. 43. Here we go. One, two, three. 
How are we doing so far, Clive? Great! Sounds really exciting. I've yeah. never heard it as well as that. Yeah. <laughs> yes! Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did it. Thank you. Yeah, this was really, really nice. Good. Should we now um, look at the uh, section thereafter? Um, so this is B. And so this is mostly, mostly done for the, for the strings now. Um, to try the, the portamenti in a, in a real real conscious way. Okay, try it. Let's let her be. We could be doing more, couldn't we? Yeah, it, it's very difficult for me to hear the detail in, yeah. with with the sound coming over. But I did what did come across to me was that every time the phrase ta ta ti da 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 was was heard, it sounded like ta ta ti da 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 rather yeah. than ti da 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 da. Yeah. Yeah. So that legato was missing. I, in the place where the violas are supposed to play herr uh, the, 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 I, I, I really couldn't tell whether they were because the sound was too muddy on the okay. on the record on the yeah. reception. Yeah. Can we try maybe well, once uh, to isolate it? Um, <laughs> can we try uh, Chevy? I mean, the, the, the most portamenti would probably have been at least the ones that we really want to notice would be the Chevy and uh, violas. Can we try the yeah. Yeah, viola, cellos, and basses at Uxhava B? Was that, was that better? Yeah. Was that better audible? Yes, yes, that was that was very clear. Um, you could even in places just make a slightly slower portamento. I mean, it, at the beginning it was it was very convincing, and then later on it became less uh, convincing. Mm -hmm. 
If anything, it, it should be the other way around. The, 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 the point of entry should become perhaps more intense. Mm -hmm. Especially the second and time. And he was trying anyway. Uh, in the uh, G flat major, you know, it, it, he gives us the the the, the Gabel, the Aufgehen, the Gabel, and we could oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he gives us uh, to Auf die, auf manche von den Dann können wir da ein bisschen, bisschen um, It's an interesting thing there, Clive. Um, yeah. Yeah. That that little little dot or dagger. Probably yeah. a bit, bit, bit of a yeah. lift, no? A light push, lightly pushed lift in the violas. Yeah. 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 And that's a real separation yeah. there, but whereas the other ones I where he's not. Put those probably should be legato. Yeah, that's right. Good. Let's do it again, just for to feel comfortable. One, two. Three. <laughs> Auch differenzieren, wie, wie die, wie die, wie die, uh, Chat, ja. So was. Ja. Ja. Ja, wissen Sie gerne. Ja. ja. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, absolutely. What we can do is, I think we should try, because we're already trying two different, two different, at least, you know, two of probably five possibilities. And if we can get two of these right, then we can start mixing, you see what I mean? Yeah. You know, that we do, do, do it right in this way, and then we can, then we can vary. I see your point, though. Could we try the same? Let's go. Yeah? I have one quick question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in, in this case, I have a feeling that your function is more rhythmic, That's rhythmic than anything. Right. Yeah, because, uh, you know, if, if everything's kind of swimmy, then, then we're lost. Right. Yeah. So a little bit of space. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I that's what I would do certainly uh, even here you know yeah. feels a little bit kind of uh, gentle in the rhythmic sense you know? right. so yeah maybe a bit more rhythm indeed could you try the same Berta It's probably worth, it's probably worth just pointing out that the hairpins go to different places in the yes. different instruments. So the cellos should come up more um, after the Oh no, yeah, mm, indeed. Let's let's observe them. Uh, G flat major. Um, Seventy nine. Tutti, um, and then when we get to the Kishtushin, make sure that that's very big on. Yeah? Berta Tutti. Sogar mit, mit, den, mit den Flöten, weil, weil es uns vielleicht ähm, ja, eigentlich Holzbläser mit dabei. Und zwei Geigen und, und die Holzbläser. Weil die haben ein gebundenes. Und we need to come, in, come into that rhythm of sound. Yeah? One, two. Was it, was it better? I think I think it's more legato now. Yeah, let's try once more. Same people. One, two. because now we have two coexisting uh, things. We have legato here, here above, and underneath we have 
you know, yum, bum, ba -da, and the jump, bum, underneath. So we still, we need to keep these worlds a little bit separate and be aware that they're separate. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Sorry, yes. just to clarify, 83, so we don't stop the bow, or we do stop the bow? You want to, the accent is for the beginning of the note, but not bow. the... Um, but, but the length is long. Yeah, the length is long. Yeah, the length is long. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I think we were doing it a little bit more. Uh, so, so up here? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the what would you, is it, would it, would it be the same, Clive, here at 83 with all the accents on the... 83. Yeah. I mean, still negato with accents, more accents, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah. well Bun, zan, zan. Dum, bun, yeah. Yeah. Key top. Dum, Key. Dum, yeah. So it's firm but connected. Yeah. Good. Should we try this? 83? 83 and then well, I want to try the one spot with the trombones. I think it's I think it's the bow speed three yeah. thing as much as anything. Um that the bow moves slower at the beginning of the note and faster towards the end of the note. Yeah, yeah. more resistant at the beginning. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I would go for crescendo, just kind of to kind of lift it up, and it in any way kind of fits the what this room wants to do. No? Probably it gets brighter. Yeah, then I would go with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think go with the nature of it. Yeah. Eighty-three. Eighty-three. Here we go. What? Two. trying to uh, place in the last, sorry, second movement, second movement with the, with the posaun and, and completely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your patience. Um, this, uh, this bit with the, uh, the, the dotted rhythms. Okay, yeah. I'm just looking for it. This is... Yep. Uh, And Clive, you, you, you have to leave us at 12, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. okay, so we have, uh, yeah, two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fine, it doesn't matter if it runs over a bit. Yeah. Okay, let's, well, let's try to keep it reasonably within time. Okay, so we are by letter P. Uh, letter P. These are the dotted rhythms you were referring to, yeah? Yes? What bar number? This is uh, bar two, three, one in the uh, second movement. In the newer edition, but it might be different in yours. I think I've got the I've got the eighteen seventy four edition. Okay, so then it's uh, not quite the same. Two seven one. Uh, probably. Probably that sounds about right. Uh, letter P two three uh, no two two nine or two two nine. Okay. No two two nine. Triple forty. Yeah. That yes. Is, yeah. yeah. So um, let's do this. It's really for the rhythm of of to try and various rhythms in the uh, in the uh, trombones and trumpets. Um, should we do maybe horns, horns, double basses. Violas and yeah, uh, and then trumpets, trumpets, trombones, and um, let's play it forte, F uh, like so less less volume to really be able to listen to the to the rhythms. Yeah. So maybe uh, what was the tempo around here? Quite broad, no? Was was sollten wir als erstes ausprobieren? Nicht an. Ja, also so spät möglich. Ja, ist gut. 
Okay, ready? Here we go. One, two, uh, two three, one. Three and uh, four and uh, one. So let's also think um, uh, we have Marcato here again. Um, but again, uh, this is an interesting case because we have all the, all the accents on top, so there is a bit of emphasis per note. But could we, could we try having a legato nevertheless? Jam, sha, yada, ra, ra, to keep the inner thread of the sound. And could we also get maybe something a little bit, a little bit um, firmer from, from those who are playing? Is it, the dynamic was fine, but maybe jump, bum, 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 a bit, bit firmer. One and two. <laughs> Bei zwei, drei, drei. Um, it's interesting. I, I think that the two, that this accent uh, schreibt, uh, um uns zu schreibt, to remind us that the motif da, da, da losgeht, ne? um, tja, ja, 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 ein Legato finden. Ja, da, da, ba, 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 so weit möglich. Direkt da, 2, 3, 3. Same people. One and two. Oh. <lacht> Das Ganze angeglichen, aber mit demselben äh, äh, Legato äh, von, von P. P nochmal jetzt angeglichen. One and two. And three. Actually, in this case, if we're really going to angleichen, then it's going to be triplets. So it's like, uh, dum, ba, ba, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, that's right. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Dum, yeah. Ba, ba. yeah. so true triplets. Yeah. Can you try this once? So, the old, this, so now we're doing the old fashioned way. So the, the yeah, the P. Four. And Yeah, I, I like this already slightly less. Yeah. Oh. No. No, I, I'm pretty sure. I, I, if you look at the autograph, it yeah. might give you a clue. Yeah, that's true. How, how he's placed it. How he's yeah. actually spaced them in the autograph. Look. I'll have thing. a look. I have it, so I'll have a look. Yeah. 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 But this was really nice. What I really liked right now was the was the legato in the in the sound. It actually gave so much more clarity actually within uh, within the line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, it's past 12. I think uh, <laughs> we haven't had a break, neither have you, Clive. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for these tips. And yeah. Thank you. 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 It's not very easy to hear it over the internet, yeah. but, um, I wish I could be with you. And, yeah, yeah, we I likewise. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Let's just open the pause and Oh yeah.
Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.